Welcome to Marriage and Life Stories with Kansime once again. It's always a pleasure having you on set and I'm always excited by your comments, by your feedback on the YouTube channel. Each time you do that, uh, I, I get encouraged to bring in more content. Today we are looking at an exciting topic and this is healing a broken relationship, healing a broken marriage. First of all, people love each other so much before they get married. And then they get to the reality of the relationship and so many things happen. What are those things that make the relationship go bad and how can we heal them? So today we are, before we look at how to heal this broken marriage, the broken relationships, we are going to look at the things that kill a relationship. Things that kill this relationship, number one, is pride. Pride, 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 and more pride. How does pride come in? You know, uh, by nature, men have their own ego. And there is a very thin line between protecting your personality as a man and falling onto the other side of pride. Now remember, pride got the devil from heaven and he lost his position and he was cast down. Pride comes from a position of knowing that you are so excellent and so good at doing this. And uh, I mean, you feel like the world will stop if you do not do that which you are doing. Now, pride in relationships. For ladies, it comes in when the man thinks you're so beautiful, when uh, the whole world thinks you're so pretty, uh, and when everyone feels that they, they, they really must have a piece of you. They must have a relationship with you. And so it fills your head. Now, my lady, when you come with that attitude, you know, that beautiful attitude, oh, he adores me. He cannot do without me. He will do anything to have me. And so you get into the marriage. You failed to work on it. Now, when you are still relating with this person, it is still a relationship. It's still a courtship. In most cases, it is the men who do so much. They do so much to win you over. They will buy the gifts. They will make the phone calls. They will, they will do anything possible to win you. Now, when you get into the relationship, it is, uh, we call it a hundred, a hundred partnership to make one hundred. Let's look at this way. The mistake that many people think that many people make is to think that you do 50 and the other 50 then you meet halfway to make a hundred that is not how it works in marriage you go all the way 100 percent and your spouse goes all the way 100 percent and when you combine the two then you get the 100 percent joy that should be in the marriage okay so that is a brief introduction of the myth of the 50-50 versus the 100-100. And so, during this time when you are learning each other, that is a time of investing. Investing in this relationship emotionally, investing in this relationship physically, investing in this relationship materially. What do I mean by emotionally? Emotionally, you have to have empathy. Yes, empathy. Put yourself in the position of the other. And remember, we are dealing with pride. Put yourself in the position of the other person and then see if what you are doing is going to be kind if it was done to you. For instance, if you want to be begged, like most ladies want to be begged, you want to be begged for everything begged for attention, begged for ministry, begged for service. You want to be begged all the time. If you had to beg your husband, would it be right? What about the men? They feel so entitled, you know? They are entitled to being served. Okay, he has come home, he wants to have his food, he wants to have, he feels entitled. He feels entitled to have his clothes washed by the wife. Who was washing for you before you got married? Hmm? You were wearing clean shirts. 
who was washing for you. So you want this girl to wash for you your clothes. You want her to cook for you your food. You are entitled to, for someone to pick up your socks. You are entitled to everything. It leads to pride. Both of you become so pride and before you know it, the relationship is dead. Number two, the things that kill marriage. These are the small, small things. Let's look at a very small one, the toilet paper and the toothbrush. What happens to the toilet paper? The lady wants it to roll from inside, you know, so that it is easy. No, it comes, the lady is normally want it to come from outside so that it is easy to cut. The men, on the other hand, they don't mind. They find the toilet paper there, that's it. Pull, use, leave the other part, you know, dropping, and that makes women mad. And so they will fight over the toilet paper. Fight over the toilet seat. You know, the ladies want to come and find a clean toilet, sit there, uh, ease themselves, and they go. Men will just come, stand there, chew around, flash, walk away, and go. It makes the women mad, like very mad. The toothbrush, the toothpaste. The ladies want to squeeze it right from the bottom. Okay, squeeze it gently, taking it up. The men will come and strangle the toothpaste right from the neck, get what they need to get, without any, you know, any design, any pattern or any thought about what they have done. The women get mad. So what are the fights for? The little things that kill the marriage. The toilet seat, toilet paper, and the, tooth, and the toothpaste. Yes, the toothpaste. Now, the little things that kill marriage, they are looked at as non-issues in most cases. But to be honest with you, the socks thrown around, hmm, the fight for who washes the underwears, in the bathroom, uh, the, the handkerchiefs, uh, what else, the comb that remains with the hair, the little things. You know, the more you get to, to each other, to stay with each other, all those little things come out. And then another thing that kills the marriage number three is resentment. Judgment, labeling, and resentment. How do those three happen together? A person makes mistakes and you know you have gotten to live with each other and so you're, you're seeing the wrong side of the other one. Either now, eh, they call it a kuta. It gets a cup and it's just kuta. They kuta the ushera, they kuta the tea, they kuta. And they are eating, you know, they are just eating. And so when that turns you off and you cannot stand it, someone talking with food in the mouth, and you cannot stand it, eventually you develop resentment for this person. Must we develop the resentment? Should you resent someone because of something they've grown up doing, the manner in which they've grown up eating? What should we do to heal this marriage which is on the rocks because of resentment, because of... Uh, the labeling, in fact, after the resentment, then the labeling comes in. You label someone as someone with bad eating, eating habits. You label someone as proud. You label someone as selfish. You label someone as uncultured. When in actual sense, these are habits that one can be supported to overcome. You can overcome the, the, the resentment. You can go beyond the resentment and you don't label someone. And when you don't label someone, eventually, this thing can be worked out. Okay, we've seen all these marriage killers. Eventually, they will lead even to separation. They can even lead to escapism. Someone just decides to go away from the home. They can lead to a silent treatment. You are leaving two people in the house, but no talking. It's how are you, how are you, and that's it. One person sits there, another one comes to sit, and they go away. So the conversation dies. Communication dies. What should we do to revive, to heal this marriage, which is slowly by slowly, process by process, dying? We shall do three things. 
Number one, among the things that we will do is avoid judging. It is a deliberate decision that you make. Okay? If someone has committed a mistake, a sin, what is the background to this sin? For instance, um, what are those things, there's so many things that uh, someone normally does. If we pick around that, that, that toothbrush, that uh, toothpaste, if someone is struggling it, before labeling this person as dirty, as uncultured, can you find out what causes this person to struggle that toothpaste? Maybe they, they were never told that a toothpaste is, eh, is pressed right from the beginning, from the end to the top. It's never been uh, their culture. They have grown up in the village and, 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 and these small, small things are not taking them, are not taking their mind. You know, it's a non-issue to them. Now, the moment you find it was a non-issue to them right from the beginning, then it is at that moment to bring it gently without judging them as being uncultured. It's like, I feel so happy when you press this toothpaste from the bottom. And that is a powerful statement that this gentleman will learn that to make you happy among the so many things that make you happy is to make sure that this toothpaste is clean, well pressed from the beginning. I feel so happy when I find the toilet seat clean. I feel so happy when uh, I, I find your, your, your socks not scattered everywhere. And by the way, if you put a basket where those socks must be put, they will put the socks in the right place. So we can avoid judging, laboring, and resentment. And that one, I can't tell you how to do it, but it is a deliberate effort. You choose not to judge. You choose not to label. You choose not to resent. We are going for a short break. And uh, we will come back to add on uh, point number two and number three. And then we can proceed. Welcome back from our, from our short break. We are looking at how to heal a, a marriage that is dying process by process. How to heal a marriage which is on the rocks. And we looked at the things. Today we are looking at the small things only that take a marriage on the rocks. We looked at pride. It begins slowly, slowly, camouflaging, you know, in, in ego, in entitlement, in laziness, and then it manifests. Now, when pride manifests, that's a very dangerous stage. We also looked at the small things we normally ignore. The toilet seat that men wait time and again and women can't stand. We have also looked at the toothpaste that the men strangle from the neck, yet women want it squeezed right from the bottom. We have looked at the socks that are normally scattered around the house. We have looked at those small things, the eating habits that get people to resent. And we also looked at a deliberate choice if you want to heal that marriage, process by process. If you want to heal that marriage, avoid resentment. Make a deliberate effort to avoid resentment, to avoid laboring, to avoid um, pride. So we look at point number two. Point number two is to be, to have empathy, to be empathetic. Now, to be empathetic means you put yourself in the shoes of the other person. If you are the one who is, you know, galloping the food on the table and someone shouts at you, how would you feel? There are things which happen because of our different upbringing. 
Now, I have seen people who, when they are seated on the dining table, they are so, you know, prim and proper. They are holding the fork and the knife this way and the other way. Sometimes I try, personally, I try and I fail and I'm like, mm -mm, I am going to eat my sweet potato with my hands and I will break it and I will eat it. I've tried the fork, it has failed. I have tried to eat my millet with a fork, it has failed. I grew up eating it with my hands. And now you are telling me I can't do it? There are times you allow people to be who they are and you love them the way they are. That is being empathetic. This person did grow up eating with forks. They didn't grow up holding the knife and, and you're now judging them because they can't use them. Avoid judgment. Avoid uh, looking at the other person's position without putting yourself in their shoes. If this person is always angry, can you find out what is making them angry and put yourself in their shoes? Being empathetic. If someone talked to you the way you are talking, would you like it? If someone treated you the way you're treating this person, would you like it? If someone demanded so much from you, the things you're demanding from this person, would you like it? I pray that you are going to learn to be empathetic with this person and it will be a great marriage healer. The relationship will blossom and it will be good. Now number three, how to heal a broken marriage. And this is the most important. Pray together. If you feel things are at a very bad stage, the marriage is separating, prayer will always heal this marriage. I know in the beginning when the relationship is not good, it is so difficult to call each other to pray. But pray for this person. Take time, kneel down and pray. And do what you would want uh, this person to do for you. Forgive them. If it is your wife, forgive her before she asks. If it is your husband, forgive him before he asks. Now, when you forgive and you let go and you love with the love of God, the relationship will heal. Now, let me tell you, there is no person that can resist love. You see, even these men that cheat, there are some who will fight their girlfriends because they've talked about their wives. And it will be a reason for them to come back to the marriage because they know the wife I left at home is an honorable, a loving, and caring wife. And if you continue to pray, even the cheating will stop. Now, I have met some ladies who say, oh, my husband cheats, I must go away from the home. You know, I cannot stand a cheating husband. Let me tell you, you walk out of a relationship because the husband has cheated. These are the things that will happen. You will go, ask for a divorce, and then, because you are already a wife who has been married, you are not going to start a marriage again with a young boy you will go and also cheat with other people's husband. So don't run out of your marriage because the husband has cheated. No, continue to pray and to be the best that you can be. You run out of the marriage and when you are out there, you would wish to come back and he is no longer interested. Just be patient and pray for him to heal. Prayer will heal a relationship. Prayer will restore a broken marriage. Prayer will get a marriage out of the rocks and put it where it should be. Now let me tell you, when you pray, it is not about telling God, oh God, this person is cheating. God, please punish him. No, that is not the prayer that we are looking at. When we are praying for a person that has a problem, we are telling God that we have a problem. We have a problem in the marriage. The man has left the home or the woman has left the home. What is it to God that we can do to make things better? God, what is it within me that you want me to do so that this marriage can be restored? Look inside of you. 
before you point out the sin of the other one, look inside of you. Ask God, is there anything that I have that I have within me that causes this person to leave me? And when God deals with you and plants so much love in your heart, there is no reason why the other person will not come back home and settle. And so we do not run out of our marriage because someone has cheated. Uh, maybe if a man is abusive and is beating and is doing, that one is a different case. We'll talk about it another time. But being the best version of yourself, the best that you can be as a child of God, will restore any marriage irrespective of what has happened. Now, the Lord says, the Bible says, God holds the heart of the kings in his hands and he will do anything that he wants. So what about the heart of your husband? What about the heart of your wife? Is that too difficult for God to handle? So pray and commit the heart of your husband, your wife in God's hand, and God will manage them into what he wants. When I had just got married, I used to hustle, praying, my husband, he must come to me. He must love me. He must, until I realized my husband belongs to God. And my prayer changed like, I would say, God, I give you my husband fully, a hundred percent. But I'm asking that you give him, loan him to me every single day and to me alone. I've been married for 33 years. God is still loaning my husband to me every single day. Let's go into a short break where we are going to do a home remedy. Uh, these home remedies are remedies that you can do in your home every single day and they will help you to have a healthy lifestyle. You don't have to pile hospital bills because you are not doing so well with these simple things that God has given us. See you after the break. Uh, welcome to our home remedy segment uh, where we are going to make a, a very healthy home remedy that will help you to build your mental capacity, that will balance your hormones and will increase your vitamin B12. Now vitamin B12 is a very rare vitamin that can only be found in meat, uh, in liver and for so those who don't take liver, those who do not take meat, in most cases they tend to be very deficient. Now, what does vitamin B12 do in the body? Vitamin B12 will help you to, um, it strengthens the production of the red blood cells and it also helps in the absorption of iron in the body. I have seen women who have uh, such heavy menstrual periods, uh, they are running out of the blood, they are taking iron supplements, then there are those who, out of no reason, they find that their hemoglobin level has dropped so significantly. By the time I decided to look for this information, at one time my hemoglobin had dropped from whatever it should be, above 12, above, uh, above 11 to 15, it had dropped up to 5. And uh, the doctor had actually suggested that they are going to do me a blood transfusion. I said, no, I don't need a blood transfusion right now. Let me look uh, at the different alternative sources and I will help myself. And so the first thing I took was a vitamin B12 jab. And then I did my research and consulted with other health practitioners and I came across this plant. Now, for the sake of your comfort, I'm going to sanitize my hands again. This is cedar vinegar. It is so healthy, it's antibacterial, antiviral, antifungal. And so in most cases, before I touch food, I use it to cleanse my hands. It is edible, it's healthy for the body. Now, I don't only use it to sanitize my hand, I also use it, it is the same here, the same vinegar, to spray on my chopping board so that there are no hidden hidden uh, bad particles or uh, bad organic orga organic um, uh, growings. And so this is the plant. I don't know what the name is called in, in English. I know only the scientific name. But this plant grows in the compound. It's like a weed. It grows in the plantation. It grows in a compound. It has three leaves. There are different types now. But the one that has three leaves 
is the one that we are working with. Now, when I realized the health benefits of this, I decided to, to be putting their organic manure around them. That is why they have grown to be this big. In most cases, they are small uh, and, and small and tall. Okay, so I use all the stems because apart from the vitamin B12, it has chlorophyll, it has vitamin C, and it is really something every person must have if you are going to boost the blood production, the health benefits of your cells, those suffering from uh, sickle cells, this is something that you need around you all the time. Now, the next plant we are using in this juice, in this juice recipe, you can put this in, steam them in whole in water and, and, and uh, simmer for a few minutes if you are using, if you don't have a blender. You can also heat them on very low heat and drink them as tea. But the best thing is to always take a plant when it is fresh. Now, I've washed them with drinking water. I have rinsed them with, a, uh, with apple cider vinegar, so there are no chances that they are bacteria. If you make a mistake and you pick plants and you take them without cleaning them thoroughly, you may pick something else which is not beneficial. Now, this plant here is a must-have. If you have gases in the stomach, it will clear them. If it is a pregnant woman, I used this throughout my pregnancy, and that child that I produced has the best skin. She has, you know, the, the, the immunity of her skin is so high, it's a very powerful plant. Now, for the women, if you're struggling in your, in your intimate relationship, this is a plant that you must have. And, uh, and for the men, it helps you with also with prostate. So, they are plants that God has put and they are excellent. Have this plant, use it in your juices, boil it and drink it, and you will not suffer most of those hormonal related challenges. Now, this plant here is called, uh, the Wanyankore call it Kutukume, and then the English people call it Gotukola. This plant is a, a powerful supplement that helps to cleanse, to cleanse the mind, the brain, okay? It helps your brain to be sharp. The people who are forgetful, it heals the, the diseases of the mind, it treats the diseases of the mind, the, the brain, sorry, and it makes your brain very sharp so for old women who are starting to forget this is a must-have for those who haven't gotten to that level that level comes whether you want it or not so to prolong it to pro prolong it and manage it right now you need this and so i'm going to make a juice out of all these three plants and uh, i'm going to blend now if you do not have a blender you can put this, uh, all these plants in a mortar, in shekuro, the, the Waganda call it in sekuro. Put them in, pound them in a clean one, well sanitized with vinegar or salt water, pound them, then put them in water and use a, a butter cloth and squeeze the juice out. You will still have the same. Okay, so I'm going to blend mine. Uh, I'll chop it to, to reduce on the blending time. Chop them thin. Now remember, cleanliness is very key. Chopping board, I use, I choose the wooden one because um, it's healthy. If even if I take pieces of wood in the things that I'm eating, they will not harm me, other than plastic. If you have a chopping board that is plastic, uh, you avoid cutting into it as much as possible because if you cut into it the particles that come off they will go in your body and they are cancerous okay you see i'm chopping them with their stem with their stalk okay. you cut with the stalk because you want to increase the amount of fiber okay last of all go to color this is a bit hard the stock are hard 
if you don't chop them fine then in most cases that you don't get the best out of the stock because they, they will remain in and, and, and broken okay here we go I always advise that you, you can only blend a minimum of three three things together because some of the ingredients cut across in the different in the different plants so if you blend more than uh, more than three then it will be like a it will be a, an, an unnecessarily increasing the, the, the sum of the of the nutrients now I'm not going to put in too much water because I want to add in yogurt when I sieve I want to put them in yogurt so that I can have them together with yogurt Now when you're working with a blender, make sure that you give it a break. It blends for 10 seconds, then you stop. Uh, if it is a weak blender, it cannot stand 10 seconds. But this one is a very strong one, so I can run it for as long as I want. But don't try it on a blender that you are not sure about. done this is the juice that has come out now for our increasing the alkaline effects of this juice okay we'll save it with this the sieve that i'm using is uh the, the metallic one that has uh, more spacing it allows much of the fiber to to go through and so I don't use the small plastic one which holds much fiber in the juice. Now to, for the safety of the juice and, and increasing the alkaline level, I am adding a lemon, just half, half a lemon, half a lemon of the uh, lemon juice, okay, I'm adding half um, Now, when you add in that half lemon, you can even see the, the green being much brighter than it was before. So, the lemon will emphasize the elements that are in this, in this plant. Now, when I was putting in these uh, herbs in the, in the jar, there was too much, too much of it. But as you can see, this is only that which has, has remained which means that this juice here is a fiber rich juice it is so full of fiber and it is going to be um, very beneficial in so many aspects in addition to fiber okay so this is our very healthy in fact, if you take this juice so many times, you'll find that your trips to the doctor, there will be very, very, very few. You can also choose to take this without any yogurt. Your memory is going to be good. Your hormones are going to be good. Now, the stomach sometimes can be big because of hormonal imbalances. Now, if you are in that category, you have a big stomach and, and you've tried to even not eat and it is not going, this is the kind of juice that you need. 
please do this recipe and save yourself those life-threatening diseases. Thank you so much. Let's do this. Let's live. Welcome back from our home remedy section where we have seen those three amazing plants with huge health benefits. And remember, using these uh, plants and, and the other home remedies we've been sharing, it will cut on your hospital bills, but it will protect your body as well so that you don't subject yourself to medication and more medication, yet some of these things you can manage at home. I want to remind you of the three things that uh, we talked about that will cause your marriage to be revived once again. And the first one uh, was avoid judging, avoid resentment, avoid pride, avoid laboring. That is number one. All of them, they come together in one, like they are relatives. When you label, then you judge, then you become proud and the thing goes. Then number two, be empathetic. Be in the other person's shoes. Is what you are doing to this person, if it is done to you, would you enjoy it? Number three, um, pray and be the best version of yourself and allow God to heal your marriage. If you find this video helpful, kindly visit our YouTube channel on marriage and life stories with Kansime. If you have not subscribed, please subscribe. Like this video and share with your friends so that it can help. See you another time. God bless you.